when you think about culling management, uh, probably this is what you're thinking of right off the top of the bat, something that's gotten old on you and you're wanting to, to, to sell that cow to, to get any value you can out of it. And so this one's pretty darn thin, like, like Dr. Lawman said. Uh, we're probably not going to get much for a price. This is not what, uh, what the buyers are looking for. They, they have to uh, actually make hamburger out of some of these, and so we'd actually probably need to blend some bull fat or some other kind of animal's fat to make this a, a really good product. So this cow could have lots of other issues. It may have a disease. Who knows what's going on there? What's one thing we can't do when we unload a cow now at the sale barn? She's got to be able to, to walk off the trailer, right? Yep. So, you know, this one's probably at that verge of whether she can actually, uh, you know, get off the trailer. Most people, most of myself included, never really thought much about, you know, when they get old, we just get rid of them, right? And so it's actually about 15% of our annual income comes from these animals. So how we market them uh, can really make our, prop, our, our enterprise a lot more profitable. So we, we probably ought to think about them a little bit more in, in when do we sell them, in what condition do they need to be in instead of getting to this. We're going to still, uh, I guarantee you've been in it long enough, you're still probably going to have some of these where you got to kind of bite the bullet and say, I'm going to get whatever I can out of, an, out of a certain cow. Yeah. Kept her too long, right? <laughs> All right? This is maybe a summary slide at the beginning that maybe I hope comes at the end as well. We want to really look through our binoculars at our entire herd. And so when I look through my binoculars and see two different cows here, what do we got on the left? Hard keeper. Okay, so you learned something from Dr. Lawman's talk. Uh, she might be on the short list of, of not fitting our environment, right? What about the one on the right? Is she a hard keeper? My right, your left, or, well, it's your, your right. Yeah. Huh? She's pretty fat, isn't she? She may not have ever had a calf yet. So... She needs to be on my list if she's never had a calf, all right? So record keeping, again, needs to be a critical component of this. So non-pregnant should be on your top. And, and so if they're not staying in the year past four years of age, um, you know, that's something you should be starting to think about and selecting. Now, has anybody got a pet cow? <laughs> okay, so we had one that raised his hand and... I'm guilty because it's usually what? It's usually your kid's cow that she showed or what have you. And, and so old sweetie here gets the extra chances, doesn't she? <laughs> yeah, since I'm not the one owning it, you know, she gets it. But, of course, dad or whoever's still paying the feed bill, right? So commercially, they all need to go when, when they don't raise you a calf. And Dr. Um, uh, Sparks, thank you, used to say if she doesn't, Create you a paycheck, she needs to be one. All right, so that's a, that's a pretty good thought to keep in mind. Old cows, um, you know, Dr. Lawman talked about the Hereford, you know, 14 years. That's a pretty long, good time for a cow to, to stay in a herd. My average uh, age of cows is 6.8 years, which I just started <laughs> keeping those records over the years and looked at them prior to this camp, so I had no idea. So 6.8 years, and I'd be one of those things that uh, hopefully I taught you this morning to start keeping records, and, and maybe you can come up with a better number than what I've got. All right, so low production, you know, that, that cow that looks good maybe like this, but she only has a 300-pound weaning calf. All right, what's going on there? She's, she's an easy keeper because she's putting it all on herself, right? We want, we want maybe that one on the left and has a six or 800-pound cow, and and problem with her is is her chance of rebreeding is is kind of the challenge there. All right. So anytime you can, Sun Up TV, Dr. Silk is is on that every every episode, I think, right, Justin, pretty much. And he'll talk about lots of different subjects and nobody tells it better on Cole Cow what the market's looking for than Dr. Silk. So if you ever get a chance, look up some of those old videos and they're three minutes long, what have you. Okay. When's the best time to, to sell cold cows? And what did he say? The worst time of the, which month was the worst time of the lowest? November. Yeah, November, December, and maybe even starting in October. So a, a 100 means that that's kind of average cow prices, cold cow prices. So when's our highest months? April and May, right? <laughs> Weather conditions can dictate a lot of times little maybe deviations from, from this pattern. This is 
a long-term history of cow prices. Here's the categories that Dr. Selk would talk about what the buyers are looking for. We've got grades on market reports that say commercial, breakers, boners, and lean. And, and again, it's the amount of fat that that animal carries, so they're looking for somewhat consistency on the amount of fat cover they have. So our, our middle ones are going to be our boners and breakers. That's really kind of the, the groups they're looking for. This one here, commercial grade, somewhere you're going to be in that body condition score 8 or 9 or that, that cow that we showed in the, in the binoculars on the right-hand side where she was really kind of too fat. That's kind of more pushing towards the commercial. So seasonal price index summary, cold cow seasonal price patterns are fairly consistent over time across any of those grades that we just talked about. They're usually the lowest in October, November, and December, and, and highest from March through August. Okay, and so that's when everybody has grass, right? It just makes a lot of sense that uh, if you're going to buy cows, you can probably make a, make a killing. Justin likes to, to turn a quick buck, right? So if you've got the grass, you know, buying some cold cows, are they going to have much health problems? Probably not. They're older. You know, they've not had those respiratory issues like the calves you saw today, right? They've just got a little better immunity. So there is a chance for, for somebody to make some money on those type of animals, right? So there's a niche there. Yeah. All right. Again, you're going to learn more about body condition scoring tomorrow from Dana Zook. And I believe Justin, right? Is that correct? Very good. So a lean cow is going to fit in the category of a four or less. And a canner is probably what we saw in the very first slide. She's less than a three, okay? All right. So you don't see that on many reports. And Hopefully we don't see many of those cows go to sale, right? A boning cow is going to be that maybe ideal situation that the buyer's looking for where it's a body condition score five. And, and what they're basing that on is the amount of lean. So when we buy lean hamburger meat, has anybody looked at that? You can get it in 70, 80, and 90% lean, correct? All right, so something that's ideal. They don't have to add any fat to it. It's going to cook well. If we get it too lean, we might have to add some fat, okay? This one, Justin's going to, I think, are you in charge of cooking on Wednesday on the hamburgers? Yeah. <laughs> Threw you under the bus today, didn't I? Sorry about that. <laughs> if they're 90% lean was my point, they're going to go up in flames pretty quick, all right? If, if they've got too much fat, he's got to have to control that, that environment as well. So, we, you know, the buyers are looking for what the consumer is wanting to, okay? So... Body condition score six and sevens fit into that breaker category, and the commercial again is above seven, so a seven, eight, and nine fat category. Just to refresh your memory or to make you start thinking about tomorrow's activity, we've got a, a one to nine scoring system, and I'm just giving you kind of the the most common that can happen. So not not so much in twos, but four, fives, and sixes. And our, dip, our breaks between uh, those, those last ones, so a three, three and a four, are going to fit into that, that what category? Three are going to fall into cutters, and that, that five is the ideal into that boner cow, right? Okay. Weight gain required to change a body condition score. So he talked about heifers a, a, minute, a while ago of changing their going from a three or going from a five to a three, what is an one body condition score change in weight? So if you're a nutritionist like myself, what is it, how many pounds of corn or whatever is it going to take to, for me to change it? And we're looking at 60 to 80 pounds is what the goal is, okay, to change one body condition score. So for it, we're at a four, we want her to go to five, she's got to gain basically 80 pounds in about 30 days. That's what it takes, okay. So a cow that's in those low categories, you know, that's 140 pounds when you add those back up to get into that five uh, market cl class. So we've, we've got a, a window if we want to buy some thin cows to market them at a higher grade, it's going to take a little bit, isn't it? All right. So good rule of thumb, about 80 pounds. So when, when we're trying to figure out a ration to balance that to make that happen, we need to know what their body condition score is at. All right. As they get closer to the ideal condition, it kind of takes a little less 
to get that done because they can actually pull from their own body reserves to make up, say, for a cold winter, a wet winter. They can actually pull from their body a lot more efficiently than they eat, say, any kind of feed. How many heifers should I keep to, to uh, recover the ones we've just sold as cold cows? All right. This is a graph showing the average cow age distribution from, from North Dakota State that, that basically provided a service of record keeping of producers in North Dakota and found out what their cow ages were. So how many cows make it beyond 10, 10 years of age? If we add these up, eight, about 11, 10%. All right, so it's not very many at that age. So if we, if we took away these, it almost equates back to our two-year-olds that we're keeping replacements for. We actually want a heifer calf to calve as a two-year-old, try and get her to rebreed as a three-year-old is one of the biggest challenges. And so we're going to lose a few each year from those categories. But so we want to think about what number do I want to keep back. And when we survey during the Beef Magazine surveyed producers in Texas, Oklahoma, Arizona, New Mexico is the orange line, and Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska is, is the green line. You know, people that culled at a rate of 1 to 10% was the highest, so a little bit lower than the gra last graph I showed you, wasn't it? But if you, if you add in that 11 through 20%, we combine those two, we're somewhere between that, that 10 and 20%, aren't we? Okay, so... That's a good number, 17%. I think that's what I'm going to use on your exercise. And, uh, you know, we start culling that 20 or 30%, we probably have some problems of, of matching our cows to our environment, don't we? Too many are falling out of the program. All right, culling decisions based on different structural issues. So this one is showing the teeth size uh, on, on that utter EPD that uh, Dr. Lawman was talking about in the Hereford breed. So these are actual pencil drawings, but which, ones, which one would you like to see a newborn calf go to? Is it number one, three, five, seven, or nine? Got to vote for a five, a three. Okay, so, so an average of a five. We kind of want to stay away from the ones and threes, and the main reason is they, they call that a bulbous teat. A newborn calf may have a little bit of trouble getting its first colostrum from these ones on the left, ones and threes. So I don't have a problem as going down to a five. Uh, the sevens and nines just for teeth size, I don't think any of those calves are going to have a problem with that, right? Okay. So somewhat of a bigger score is better for teeth size and shape. All right. Utter suspension. So that's basically what's holding this utter attachment up. And as we go from the left to our right here, we've got a score on the, on the left with a 9, and the one here on the right with a score of a 1. Okay, So it's not very good. Higher numbers are better on, on either one of those scoring systems that we just, those last two slides. And the main reason, again, if this starts to drop down, that calf having to dip its head down to actually get nourishment is a problem. So we tend to see this in what kind of cattle? Dairy or beef cows? Yeah, more dairy. They can only last so long because that's what they're bred for is to milk, milk, milk. Okay. Good way to look at your cows. I've had people say, man, I've gone home and looked at my cows a little bit differently, and that's going to be part of your culling exercise today, is look at them from behind to see ones that have a strong udder attachment. If they don't have this line or demarcation here, that's that ligament that's holding it up. Where are these teats at? Are they facing straight down or are they splaying out to the side? Yeah, so they get weaker, they splay out, and it's a little harder for that calf to find, find nourishment. So here's an actual score where we're looking at teat size first and the udder attachment next. So we've got up there on your left an udder score of 99, which would be almost ideal. Okay, strong, it's up close to the body. Teat size are small where the calf has an easy opportunity to nourish. Down here, a 2-1 score. Does she even have four teats there? They almost look like they're coming together, don't they? So that calf may be able to find it, but they're awful, awful bad on size as well. Okay. So this comes from the Beef Industry Federation. So that's their scoring system that can be used in almost any breed, if you will. 
So if anybody said, it's up to you to decide what, what score you want to give your cows, but for me, I, I don't have a problem with any on the top row, right? And I might not even have too much of a problem with that 55 there. Okay, we start getting down here in these other two pictures. That they need to be on your on your horizon as ones to go. Now, what happens with cows as they get older? Does that utter uh, ligament strength? Does it stay the same or do what? Oh, yep, it gets weaker. That's right. So. You may be good for six or seven years, and then all of a sudden that cow loses that strength, and, and she, that's, that's the time to, to pull the trigger. All right. Dr. Lawman also talked about that foot scoring system. So Angus has come up with a, a uh, visual, what are we looking for on, you know, a side view, what's normal, what, what, what do we want to stay away from? All right, so we've got a normal with that angle somewhere around that 40, 30 to 45 degree angle for that pastern, and they really have found that out through dairies. If they have that good angle, they stay in the milking herd a, long, a lot longer time. Look at the sole, all that looks good for normal. What do we got here? We've got one large out uh, hoof, and they kind of <coughs> curl around. These two kind of go into each other. What does that cause? It causes some, some pain issues. And so what are we going to have to do? Either trim it, which to me is the number one thing I don't ever want to do is trim a cow's hooves. So. All right. Too straight. If an animal has too straight up and down, post-legged. All right. If that was a bull, what was his chances of, of getting lame from going out and breeding a bunch of cows? He just doesn't have that uh, structure that we want in a, in a bull. So this is kind of giving you a side view of, of feet conditions to cull for. And again, cow on your, on your upper there has one of these hooves that was, was larger on one side, and they've gone ahead and trimmed that. And once they do that, look how it kind of straightens out how she walks. So there are some things you can do to just visually see yeah, it, it's not the same cow, I know, but <laughs> different, different side view, you think? Yeah, but that, that's what you could see on trimming it. Now, more than likely, you trim it once, what's going to happen? It's going to continue to grow, and you're going to do it again and again and again. So I don't even want to mess with them. There's, those are going to be higher on my list to cull. Okay. So good feet. What they've, what they've come up with is a one to nine scoring system. And what they're looking for, again, is that angle on the side. And they want those hooves to be ideal. And so an ideal hoof score would be a five. So you're seeing one here that's got that angle, 30 to 45 degrees. What about this one? Score to one. It's more post-legged, isn't it? Both ends of the spectrum, a one and a nine are not good. We're looking for a five. So that's what they call the foot angle and the claw set. So a five for, for the angle. And what we're mainly looking for is, is that division between the toes for a score of a five there. So this gives you each, each score from one to nine. Hopefully everybody's cows are in that five or six category, I hope. And that's what I've gone in, in judging teams at like OSU. If you're in the purebred business, that's what they recommend is have some of those kids come out and score them for you. That way you're not biased in, in you know, say an old sweetie there. I don't want to lose her, so I'm going to score her or whatever. <laughs> and, and that's what I've been asked to do at time to time is some of the purebred guys would say, uh, would, you, would you score my cattle at, at weaning time? And so as they're going through the shoot, that's, that was my job to write them down and then turn them over to them. They turn it into the association. Other culling decisions is, is you know, muscle and, and structure. If, a, if an animal's got a lot of, uh, of muscle, like you think of limousine or charlet or the double muscle breeds, they bulge out, don't they, up here? They've got a lot of shape on the sides. And so they're almost what they call bow-legged versus one that tend to, tends to uh, turn in or cow-hocked, tend to be a little, let, little less muscular. Think of them more like dairy cattle. And what we're hoping to get is something in the middle, all right? We don't want the extremes on either end. 
So I've noticed on my cows that they tend to be going a little bit more in this direction. And so what do I need to do? How would I improve that condition? Do I need to add more muscle or, or take it away? You probably add more muscle, right? Exactly. Eyes are another category we want to look at cows. They do tend to be breed specific, but I've seen more recently that black cattle are, you know, tend to have some pink eye just as easily as a Hereford calf can have pink eye. And we know we need to distinguish between pink eye and what's cancer eye, okay? A lot of times what you'll see on, on pink eye is a, is a tearing effect. First, if you can catch that early, you can treat it and it's not that big of an issue. And so that's kind of what you see down here. Versus up here, we've actually got some scar tissue on that eye. And hopefully that, that's not uh, what, what was the Dr. Talley's scenario that he had on this particular cow. Maybe it's a combination of screw worm. I don't know. <laughs> so docility. Anybody got some uh, Nelore cattle that the Brazilians use? They're pretty good at, in, the, in the rodeo uh, arena, aren't they? So they're normally known for, for not the easiest temperament. And so we've got a scoring system anywhere from, from one to, to six. And six being very aggressive you know, it thrashes about or, or attacks wildly when combined in small, tight places, pronounced attack behavior. So that's just one that, I, for me, a six is one I don't even, I can't hardly even get in the pen with them, right? All right, so that's one end of the spectrum. I don't like cattle that are too docile as well because they tend to not be very aggressive at the feed bunk, okay? So when other cows are bullying them around, at, say you're putting out hay or any kind of supplementation, they tend to not get very much uh, nutrients and, and they fall out of the herd mainly because of their docility and their aggressiveness to stay in the herd. So my professor in genetics used to say everything in moderation, so you're probably looking for something right in here. As I get older, I want them to be more tamer because I sure as heck don't want to get hurt right out there. So I do consider what they call a docility EPD. Limousine was one of those breeds when I was in grad school that tended to be very aggressive. My professor uh, bought some of those for me to bring indoors and put in these heat chambers and they about killed me. And I told him, don't ever buy me those again. But that breed, just like the Hereford example Dr. Lawman used, has used this docility EPD and has made tremendous strides. Uh, Sometimes it's by adding something like Angus into the mix, but uh, <laughs> all right. And so the docility EPD is this one right here. It'll, it'll look like Doc. And you do need to know what the actual breed average is for whatever breed you're dealing with. So this four may mean nothing based on, on what I'm showing you here compared to what the breed average is. Again, culling decisions based on how this EPD became about. Here are the breed averages. So that last one I showed you a four, and this was an, an Angus sire. And so if we look at just Angus, there's uh, nearly 440-some thousand records, and the average was nine. So we want a higher number. So that one was not as good a candidate as I would like to make improvements on docility. And again, comparing one in an Angus to another one, say limousine. So the breed average for limousine is 16. It's just whatever scoring system they come up with and what base, sign, base number they come up with.